The name Tupelo comes as an afterthought and a way of describing the Civil War battle that was fought in and around the little settlement thick with black gum trees. Before that, it was known as Gum Pond, a soggy, boggy, swampy piece of panland. Looking north from the highest point on South Gloucester, the lay of the land slopes downward, the same looking westward from the highest point on East Main, like the crusty drippings from a frying pan, the good stuff, rich, fertile black topsoil washed down, making the area prime farming and grazing land. The settlers wheelbarrowed in dirt and built up a nice mound for their little town. By 1886, the first drainage laws ever in the United States were enacted at the Lee County Courthouse, and 2,000 acres of bog was turned into Tupelo. And what a town Tupelo was. It became the first TVA city in 1933 and was visited by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1934 to honor the occasion. Cruising through town and its grid of avenues, streets, and even alleyways named for favorite sons and daughters, and you wonder who those people were. And how did they come to deserve such an honor? Memorial set in stone, under the famous and the infamous. Who's who is often according to which side of the fence you're on. Looking for a way to super capitalize on Tupelo's cotton forming industry, John M. Allen, John C. Clark, C.P. Long, Clovis Hines, and others organized and financed the Tupelo Cotton Mill in 1900. All the hoopla about restoring Mill Village that's a good thing. It's a good story that deserves recounting. Tupelo had legendary leaders then and now, but it was the everyday people that made it memorable. The three-block area known as Milltown developed around Tupelo's first largest industry around 1911, Milltown Industrial Complex. The mill processed cotton from the sea to the feet and beyond. It ginned it, compressed it, dyed it, made the yarn that became the thread that wove the cloth that made the shirts that looked so good with the dresses that milady wore. The mill's trademark was the bluebird, and it turned out 25 miles of cloth every day. The byproducts were lucrative industries within an industry. The seed were pressed into oil, and the mash turned into cow feed. All was good. Well, then, there was that little nagging about the possibility for sure of child labor. The village grew and grew, becoming thick with white or yellow painted houses. It had its own school, grades one through four, a semi-pro baseball team. It was good. With the mill complex running full speed ahead, cotton farmers were guaranteed of a good end for their products. Farmland kept spreading east and west, north and south. The mighty bowl was king. Cattle industry hung in at second. In May of 1927, the Carnation Milk Processing Plant opened. Good pay, 32.5 cents an hour. Tupelo was booming. Like all good dances, sooner or later, somebody had to get on a step. Tupelo Industries of today have seen a few strikes and disgruntled workers, but nothing like what happened in Milltown in 1937. Working 45 hours a week, Jimmy Cox led a strike full raise and less hours. The strike was supported by George McLean. He said the mill had the people working for starvation wages under the guise of progress. Of course, merchants who depended on the workers spending their 32.5 cents an hour with their establishments were upset. The town boycotted McLean, the then three-year-old North Mississippi Daily Journal. The boycott was ineffective and McLean just kept on journaling. The strikers kept striking. Nostrils flared, tempers soared, got so hostile the National Guard came in in a show of bravado, practicing their weapon-firing skills on the Mill Village baseball fields. Armed with wrenches, sticks, and testosterone, the mill villagers revolted. The villagers rushed the field, ready to do battle. 
Guard Commander Sam H. Long pulled back the guard, but the strikers would not be saddled. They sat themselves down in the first sit-in ever in the state of Mississippi and would not move. Governor Hugh White met with them April 14th of 37, but nothing was resolved. General Manager J.H. Ledyard locked the doors, liquidated the assets, and closed the books on Tupelo's first mega industry. Mill Village had survived the 1936 tornado only to die an agonizing death a year later. Many workers moved away following their skills to other cotton mill towns, West Point, Winona, Yazoo, Kosciuszko, Starkville. So when you pass through Mill Village, stick out your chest and honor those first timers who gave it their best, even until they lost their shirts.